Hi, this is Dan Heisman. We're continuing with our series of YouTube videos to help you improve your chess game. If you haven't told your friends about our channel, uh, that would be great. Today, I'm going to talk about uh, what you should think about when it's your opponent's move. And the first thing I have to say is there's no more generic correct answer to that than there are is what you should think about during your move. As always, it's going to depend on the clock situation, the board situation. Uh, it depends on a lot of things. All right, why does it depend on the clock situation? Well, obviously, suppose you're playing a 2-0 game where you have two minutes for the whole game with no increment. You're not going to be doing a lot of thinking on your opponent's time. I mean, you're going to think as much as you can on your opponent's time. You're not going to get up and get a glass of water. You're going to be concentrating on the board as much as you can. But he's going to be moving every second or two, so by the time you catch your breath from the time you made your move, it may be your move again. So yes, you're going to think on your opponent's time, even in a two-minute game, as much as you possibly can, but it's not going to be as much as you would on a, in a two-hour game. So a lot of these things are dependent on these kind of situations. Now, having said all that, there's two generic answers that I like to start with. The first answer is... When you make a move, it stops your clock, which means you, you have now have a fixed point of reference for how you're doing on time management. So the one thing you want to do always is look at your clock while your opponent's thinking and say, based on the time situation and based on the position, am I playing too fast or am I playing too slow? Remember, what you're trying to do is pace yourself so you take almost all your time for a game. If you do, then you're doing the best that you can, sort of like taking the whole two hours for an essay test. Well, if you're playing too fast, then you want to start adjusting accordingly and taking more time on the upcoming moves where you need some thought. And if you're playing too slow, then starting on the next move, you have to play a little bit faster, set a little bit better threshold for playing a little quicker so that you don't get into unnecessary time trouble. So that's always my first answer to what you should think about when it's your opponent's move. The second thing is some advice that I was given many, many years ago, which was during your own time, you have to think about specific lines of analysis. Now, obviously, weaker players do something that I've uh, called hand-waving in my earlier videos, where they're not actually doing specific analysis. They're doing generalized thinking, even when they should be doing specific analysis. But that's not what you really should be doing on your time. If you have a concrete position with very specific move sequences that are possible, checks, captures, and threats, possible tactics. You want to be thinking in move sequences on your move. And what they said was, that's what you want to do on, on your move, but on your opponent's move, you want to be thinking in terms of general strategy. So that was their advice. Their advice was, your move, specific sequences, their move, general strategies. Or we could even say, hand-waving is more acceptable during your own move. All right, well, that's true, and that's reasonable advice, but that's not everything you want to do. Let's take one more extreme case. Suppose you make a move and your opponent's move is forced, but for whatever reason, he's not making that move. Maybe he's trying to look ahead. Maybe he doesn't realize it's forced, whatever it is, but you're sure that he has a forced move. Well, in that case, you could easily think on his time just as well as you can think on yours, you can just assume he's going to make that move. And then you could say, what am I going to do? Let me start thinking about my move on his time. And you can save time on your clock by assuming that move. Now, a lot of people think that's what you should do when your opponent does not have a forced move. For instance, let's say he has four different moves he could play that are all reasonable. They think you should probably pick out the most reasonable one and start thinking about what you would do if he makes that move. Well, okay, if, he, if he's taking 20 minutes on his move, you might be able to do that. But in general, it's very inefficient to do that. The reason is, you don't know what he's going to play. And if he has a whole bunch of reasonable moves, you're a little bit wasting your time by looking at each single one, trying to kind of guess what he's going to play and guess what you're going to do. Because you really are hedging your bets. If, each, if he has four moves and they're each 25%, then there's a 75% chance that when you're analyzing one, you're kind of wasting your time. Now, you could argue, okay, Dan, but, you know, if you do all four of them while he's doing his move, then you don't have to think as much on your time. Well, yes, and people do do that, and it's not unreasonable to do that. It's just that in the long run, trying to guess your opponent's move when he has lots of choices is 
probably not the most efficient thing you can do with your time. You're probably better off doing other things, looking for, as we said, general ideas, maybe finding his most dangerous move rather than his most likely move and seeing whether or not it's as dangerous as you think it is, things like that. So what I think I'd like to do is maybe take some positions from amateur and grandmaster games and let's pretend it's the opponent's move and we'll see what we might be thinking about. And let's start with the move a3. Let's say white plays a3 and, and you're black and you play e5. Let's flip the board here. And now you're waiting for white's move. And let's say white, even though this is a, a book move for white after a3, he's not playing it for some reason. Maybe he doesn't even know that a3 is not a book move and he doesn't know what to do. All right, well, you could start thinking about things in general here. You can't analyze a lot of specific sequences, but you could say to yourself things like, gee, if he plays e4, I can't play a Roy Lopez in reverse because when I try to play bishop to b4, he's got a pawn on a3. So if he plays e5, a Roy Lopez in reverse won't work. On the other hand, if I play maybe an Italian game in reverse, he might be able to play b4 and hit my bishop. If you don't understand what I'm talking about, basically white has traded places and you're saying, if he plays something like this and you play bishop here, maybe pretty early he can play b4 and maybe that's not as good for your bishop. Although if you play bishop b6, you're really transposing into a a6 b5 kind of line of the Roy Lopez, but upside down. So I'm just thinking of some general things you might be thinking of, but you can't think of specific sequences. You certainly aren't gonna know what he's gonna play. He could play e4, he could play b4, he could play d3, he could play g3, he could play knight c, c he could play c4 and play uh, re reversed English. He has lots of reasonable moves here, but you could generalize and say, gee, if he doesn't do anything, if he keeps playing his Rook pawns up, maybe I'll grab the center with d5. You know, that's the kind of thing you could think about. But there's not a lot of specific things to look at here. All right, let's go back to the actual game. And let's see what the players played. Let's, uh, let's pretend we're white. We'll flip the board. So let's, let's go a few moves into the game. We have an English here. And now we've kind of transposed into a symmetric position. All right, let's say you just played a3 and you're waiting for black's move. Well, there's not going to be any big specific things that you're going to be able to calculate. You can't say, well, if he plays bishop takes a3, should I take with the pawn or the rook? That would be silly. So what you're trying to do is just say, let's suppose he develops the bishop. Then you say, all right, well, what would I be trying to do? Well, you're trying to get out the rest of your pieces. So one of the questions you would ask yourself in a position like this is, where and when do I want to develop the bishop on c1? Do I want to develop him right away? And then you could say to yourself, well, if, if I play my bishop to g5 and he plays h6, do I really want to play bishop takes f6 and give up the bishop pair so easily? Because if I, if I play bishop g5 and he plays h6, I can't go to h4 because he has g5 trapping my bishop. So I probably want to develop my bishop to the f4 square. But suppose he plays bishop d6 first, and I, can I then put the bishop on f4 anyway and allow him to double my pawns with bishop f4, gf4? Maybe not, but if he plays bishop d6, what am I going to do with the bishop? All right, so that's a reasonable thing to think about because bringing out that bishop is clearly one of your next things that you want to do. Another question you could ask yourself while your pawn's thinking is, wow, I could play a break move like e4 here, and I could prepare it with moves like uh, rook to e1 or knight to d2 or knight to g5 or queen to c2. Do I really want to do that? Is that the right idea in this position <clears throat> is to play for the e4 break? Normally the answer is no, because after he takes you with his d-pawn, your d-pawn becomes isolated. But you can ask yourself those kind of general questions. You know, what do I want to do? So these are very specific kind of ideas, but they're not very specific in terms of checks, captures, and threats. There's not much happening here. Let's go a little further in the game, see if we can get a different kind of thing to think about on his time. All right, so he does play bishop d6. White plays bishop g5. Here's where I would expect black should play h6, and he does. And white's going to have to make a decision here on what he wants to do. He decides to go all the way back to c1. Well, 
Not sure forcing h6 was worth the two tempos to bring the bishop out. Okay, queen there. Is he threatening to take the pawn? Well, it's White's turn, so he's not going to think about this on his opponent's turn. He plays g4. Black saves the bishop. He plays g5. Break move. Pawn takes. Now I can put the bishop there. <clears throat> Knight goes to h5. e4. As we said, normally White has to be careful about doing this because pawn takes pawn. Knight f4. All right, so let's make one more move. White plays, knight takes. Well, now, see, this is a good example. Let's say you play knight takes c6, d6, and white doesn't immediately play queen takes d6. Maybe he's looking at knight takes h3 check. Maybe he's looking at knight takes g2. In fact, knight takes g2 is a move. So that's, that's what we could look at now. We could say, all right, he's only got two moves that capture a piece. He has to play either queen d6 or knight takes g2. Okay, but those are his only moves, so let's start analyzing one of them. Which one would I be a little more worried about? Let's say he plays knight g2. Could I somehow move my knight on d6 as a desperado knight and do something? I don't really see any great places. If I save the knight on d6, he takes my rook on e1 and wins the exchange. So if he plays knight takes g2, I think I'm just going to have to play king takes g2. Okay, suppose he plays queen takes d6. What could I play then? Well, uh, he is not threatening too much. He still can play knight takes g2. I could try to save the bishop with bishop f1. Doesn't look very good. I could probably just attack his knight with queen to d2. And if he plays knight takes g2, play king takes g2. If he plays knight d3, I could move the rook on e1 and my b2 pawn is guarded by my queen on d2. So queen takes d6, bishop f1 is possible, queen takes d6, queen d2 is possible. And, and you know, while you're thinking about this, at some point he's going to make one of those two moves, and then you could hone in on that particular move. So this is an example where black's move is not forced, but he only really has two moves, so, so you could somewhat efficiently try to think on his time. Let's see what Stockfish says about which of those two moves is better. Probably knight takes g2, but I don't know. All right, Stockfish says, yeah, knight takes g2 is much better. And it says black's pretty much winning after knight takes g2, king takes g2, queen d6. And white's king side is all opened up with a g4, g5 break move. And white's king is in some trouble. And Stockfish says if black plays knight g2, black should win. Okay, let's go back to the game. <clears throat> knight takes g2 was played. King takes, takes. Queen d2, bishop hits the knight, rook goes up to e4, bishop takes, king takes, queen pins the rook. He could have also played queen h2 to keep your king out of the corner. That, that was a possible move, threatening the pawn on h3. Queen pins the rook. Now he's threatening f5. If white doesn't play a move like king e3, then f5 is going to win the rook. So... You know, if I'm black and white's thinking here about what he wants to do, I'm thinking, well, he has to play king e3 or king f4 and guard the rook because if he plays, well, if he plays king e3, then queen takes g5 check. So now we're starting to think that maybe black is winning by force because if white guards the rook with anything but the king, then f5 is going to win the rook for a pawn. If white plays king e3 then black can calculate queen takes g5 check. But if white plays king f4, then queen f5 check hits the rook and the bishop. And if white plays king to e3 to continue to guard the rook, then queen takes g5 check again. So it looks like if you're thinking on, if you're black and you're thinking on white's time here, you can pretty much calculate that you're, that you're winning the game. All right, let's see what happened. White plays the desperate move, bishop, G, bishop f6 which is kind of a clever move to say to say to black, all right, I'm going to stop f5, and what are you going to do about it? If black plays queen to f5 check, you can play rook f4, and black doesn't have time to take the bishop. Although black could probably play queen f5 check, rook f4, queen h5 check, and then take the bishop. 
If black takes the bishop right away, maybe white gets a little bit of play with uh, rook g4 check, king h7. He has to, can't play king h8, queen h6 is mate. So g takes f, rook g4 check, king h6. And then white could try to get either rook a, g1, threatening rook h4, or maybe bring the king, queen up. So I like white's move, bishop f6. So now if I'm waiting for black to play here, and I'm white, I'm thinking, all right, if he plays pawn takes, do I play queen h6 or do I play rook g4 check? Which one's more accurate? If I play queen h6, then maybe he'll play f5, stopping my rook from going to g4, but then I can play rook h4, threatening queen h8 checkmate. That's looking awfully good. On the other hand, I could play rook g4 check, king h7, and then maybe rook 1, g1, threatening rook h4. That looks pretty good too. It looks like pawn takes bishop is just a bad move. Black should probably check with the queen and then think about taking with the bishop after the queen's in the defensive area. So black has lots of things he could do here. And if you're white, you could, you could kind of figure out what they are. Let's see what black played. He quickly takes the bishop. Wow, this game is really turned around. That move looks like a big blunder. Let's ask Stockfish if it is. All right, Stockfish, is Bishop F6 the best move? Let's go back two moves. Bishop F6, is that the best move? Yes, it is, but it's still completely losing. And G takes F6 is not a blunder. It's okay. Black can get away with it. Okay, I was wrong. All right, let's go back. Pawn takes. So now we have to look at Rook G4. Oh, we can't play Rook G4 check. It's pinned to the king. So that's a that's a visualization error, of course. So Black White has to play like rook g1 check first and then try to get a piece to the h file and that's not as easy with the rook pin let's see what white does white plays queen h6 threatening rook g1 mate okay so now i'm waiting for black to reply well black only has so many moves to stop the mate what could he play well let's see here he can play knight takes d4 check that looks like a pretty good move if white plays king e3 then knight f5 check wins the queen and then we're not going to get mated. If knight d4 check and the king goes to the g file, then he can't play rook g1 check. And if he goes away to the g file, I can just play queen takes e4. So knight takes d4 check looks pretty good. If the king goes to e3, I fork him on f5. If he goes to e2, I take the rook with check. If he goes to g3, I can just play queen takes e4 and he can't play rook g1 mate or rook g1 with mate so knight d4 check looks like it's pretty much winning is that the only winning move i don't know let's take a look knight d4 check completely winning all right let's see what black played black plays queen f5 check all right so if i'm black and i'm looking at white's move his moves are fairly forced if he moves the king to the g5 i can take the rook so, and I think if he puts the queen in the way, I can just trade queens and win the end game down a knight. So white pretty much has to play either king e3 or rook f4. So if I'm black and I'm, I'm playing this position, I'm going to start analyzing rook f4. I'm going to start analyzing king e3 because he only has two reasonable moves. It's fairly forcing. So I can think on his time. Let's see what white does. He plays rook f4. Now threatening the queen and threatening to put a rook on the g file. So black has to think about maybe keep checking here with a move like queen d3, but then rook g4 check becomes a real threat. So black's in some trouble all of a sudden from completely winning. Let's ask Stockfish again. Is, is white getting to be okay here yet? Yes. We went from minus 13 with that move to plus two, so that was like a 15 pawn blunder. All right, we can finish off this game, then we'll look at a GM position. Knight takes check, king g2, queen h7. Now white could trade queens and take the knight. That probably wasn't his best idea to play knight d4 check. He checks first, king over, queen takes check, queen in the way, and white can just take mate. Checkmate. Okay, let's take a look at a GM game. We'll see what we can think about on their time. Let's go to the Tot to Steal tournament. Uh, let's see here. Library. 
Tat uh, 21. All right, what day of the month is this? Today is the, uh, today's the eight, today's not the 18th. Today is the 25th. Let's take the 25th game in the library. 25th game, examine, Tata, 21, percent 25. Okay, game between Esipenko and Grandilius. Esipenko yesterday beat Magnus Carlsen in a very widely acclaimed game. Esipenko's only 18 years old. Obviously, he's got a great future. Let's, since we did the 25th game, let's take the 25th move. So let's go forward, 20, forward 48 half moves. Okay, so if we're black here and it's white's move, we just played bishop e4, hitting the queen on c2. Well, this is fairly forcing. The queen doesn't have a lot of safe moves. The queen could go to c1, d2, d1, or b3. Okay, so... Can we start thinking on his time? I think we can. Uh, Grandelius has 20 minutes left. Esipenko has 10, so Esipenko's not going to take a long time. So one of the things we could do is we could categorize queen d2 and queen d1 as sort of queen goes to the d file. So let's categorize that. Queen goes to the d file. Is there anything black can do? Can he put a rook on the d file? Rook d6 is not safe. Rook d8 is not safe. So queen to the d file might be okay. Uh, queen to b3. If he goes queen to b3, is he threatening anything? The rook on e6 is guarded. Um, doesn't look like it. Queen to c1. Um, not sure why he would play that, but it doesn't look terrible. If he plays the queen to the d-file, maybe we can get ready to play a rook to the d-file. Maybe we could play a move like uh, queen to c6, threatening rook d6 in some lines, but the rook on e6 is tied down guarding the knight. Maybe in some lines we can pop our knight into d3. Um, so we can't do a lot of thinking here. By the way, this brings up an interesting question, which is if you can't analytically think on your opponent's time because he has too many choices, what else can you do? Well, if you're playing in a tournament, as Andy Solis likes to say, when he gets ready to play the endgame, he gets up and gets a glass of water to remind him that the principles in the endgame are different than the principles in the middle game. So he's using his opponent's time to, you know, go to the bathroom, get a glass of water, get something to eat. You know, the, when you're playing a four-hour game, you don't want to just sit there unmoving for four hours. It's not only not good for your body, it's actually not even good for your brain. I was just watching an interview on television about that yesterday. So you don't want to just sit there. It's not good for you. If you know your opponent's going to go into a long think because... There's lots of time on his clock and his position is complicated. That's a great time to get up, walk around a little bit, check out your, your friend's games. Uh, of course, when you're playing online, you can't do that. Uh, but we're talking about may, after the uh, pandemic is over and you can go back to playing over the board. Yeah, you can walk around a little bit. Um, I don't suggest you walk around after every single move because half the time your opponent will move in 30 seconds and your clock will be running and you're wasting a lot of time. You want to make sure your opponent's in for a fairly long think before you do stuff like that. But that happens a few times a game. So you want to stretch, you want to get up, you want to, you know, get get your glass of water or get your uh, snack. You can't eat anything that makes a lot of noise like pretzels or potato chips, but you know, you could have a little, little bowl of pasta that you brought with you in a little plastic bag or something to keep your carbs up while you're playing. So these are the kind of things that you can certainly think about doing when it's your opponent's turn. Um, all right, so back to back to this game. So there's, I don't think there's a lot that, that Grandelius is going to be thinking about here. He's going to be thinking more in terms of, you know, gee, my bishop and my queen are on the diagonal, and he's tied up guarding the g2 square. Is there any way I can add more pressure to that square? That's the kind of general thinking that he's going to be doing. Let's let's see if we can go maybe more toward an end game and see what happens. Still quite middle gamey here. He might get some trades, who knows. There's a trade of rooks. Looks like white's going to repeat the position. So here of course, if you're white and you're waiting for black to move, you're saying, okay, I just checked him once on a8, and he went up. He could go to either g8 or 
h8, he can play g6, but I'm not worried about any of those things. What I'm worried about now is, if he goes back to h8 like he did before, should I just take a draw here? Well, you have to evaluate the position. If you think your position is equal or worse, then taking a draw is certainly a strong consideration. If you think you have good winning chances, then of course you're not going to take a draw. Just looking at the board here, you know, White's pieces on the H file are a little awkwardly placed. They're not well stuck for, for uh, attack. The rook on the F file is attacking a pawn on F6 that's guarded. Black has a rook on the 7th rank, which is very powerful, and he's attacking the pawn on B2. If I were White and Black offers me a draw by repeating the position, my evaluation of the position is I'm probably not, not at all winning. I'd be pretty happy with the draw. So if he repeats the position, I'm going to take it. Black does go there, white does repeat, black goes there, and the two players agree to a draw. Let's ask Stockfish what the, what the uh, evaluation is. Stockfish says, yes, black is better. What he should have done after the check is to play king g8. And if you check him again, to play king f7. And now white has nothing better than trading the bishop. Suggest black should take with the rook. If white takes this pawn, a6, queen takes g3. Knight f5 hitting the queen. Queen d3 centralizing the queen, hitting the rook. King g1 guarding the rook. And now tuck the king back away, king g8. And it suggests that black's ahead by a little more than a pawn, which is a pretty big lead. So white was thinking on black's time, boy, I'd like to take that draw, and if white was thinking about, and if black was thinking on white's time, black has to think about the same thing. And black probably should have said, gee, if I can find a line where I can get out of this without giving up a draw, I probably have a pretty good position. But uh, Grandelius gave Esipenko the draw. Okay, so we haven't covered every possible case. We really didn't look at end games. And as I said, it's like at the start of the video, I said it's sort of like saying what you should think about on your time. It really varies a lot according to you know, how many reasonable moves the opponent has, how much time you have, does he have force moves, what part of the game are we in. But remember what I said at the start, always check your, your time and ask yourself that really, really important question, am I playing too fast or am I playing too slow? And then start to adjust accordingly. Okay, I hope you enjoyed today's video. We gave a little bit of information on everything, on what to do on your opponent's time. I'm sure there's more that we could have covered, but We'll see you then next time. All right, if you like the video, you can hit the like, you can subscribe, but the most important thing is tell other people about the channel. See how many people come in and uh, help us with the uh, channel statistics. We'll see you next time. Thanks, bye.